Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you for, for coming to this Oceana semester presentation. And I'd like to give you the event code for today's talk. Uh, it's 6011, and that's for those of you who uh, are interested in taking the survey at the conclusion of this presentation. You can find the URL and the event code um, QR inside the Oceana semester brochure. And if you take the survey, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $1,000 study abroad grant. And so the more events you attend, the more surveys you complete, the better your chances are of winning that $1,000 grant. So again, 6011 is the event code that you would need to take that survey. So Dr. Lamont Lindstrom is back for his third and final presentation today. He is chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Tulsa, where he's been on the faculty since 1982. And I was interviewed by a Joplin Globe reporter a couple days ago doing a preview of his coming to Missouri Southern, and she was looking through his credentials, and she said, he's really a big deal, isn't he? And I said, yes, he is. And so we're very fortunate that someone of his expertise you know, is only 100 miles away and willing to come and speak to us. Dr. Lindstrom has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He's written numerous books, co-authored other books, written journal articles, made presentations. Uh, but probably most interesting to me is, as, a, uh, as an anthropologist, he has traveled to the, there's a small, well, not small, but one of the 14 countries of Oceania is, is Vanuatu, and he has traveled there at least 20 times conducting research. And so, uh, for those of you who aspire to be anthropologists, uh, you get to do some amazing research. So, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lindstrom back to the stage. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Prof Professor Stevens and uh, the Oceanic Sem Seminar uh, ongoing uh, for the invitation to come up here to Joplin. And, I've already talked this morning about kava, which is a really interesting traditional Pacific drug substance. And we talked about uh, the cargo cult, which is a, a, a story of uh, post-war social movements in the Pacific. So my third and last time, and thank you for coming, is uh, allows me to talk about a place I've been going to off and on since 1978. How many years is that? That's like 41 years. So I was like just a kid the first time I went there. Uh, but um, I like the people and I love the place so much I've gone back as many times as I can. Um, and this is kind of a story of what's happened over the last four decades to a small Pacific island village in a small country that hardly anybody has heard about. Um, a couple of opportunities, maybe you had a grandfather or grandmother in World War II, they could have been in what was then the New Hebrides, uh, or maybe you watched Survivor. Um, about a decade ago, there was an old Survivor episode set in this country. Um, so the talk today is going to be about, if I could get this going, um, people on the island of Tana and what's happened to them um, since the late 70s. So this is Tana on the left here, um, and this is Vanuatu, um, when, when these islands uh, achieved their independence from France and Great Britain, who together ran the place as a really strange condominium, they called it Condominium Colony. It became independent in 1980 and changed its name. Um, Antana um, is here, down in the southern part of the island chain. About 275,000 people live there, so fewer than the population of the city of Tulsa. But it's a really interesting place if you're an anthropologist or a linguist. They keep Raising the number, but the last number I saw was 137 different languages spoken by, you know, 275,000 people. So um, if you like languages, it's a, it's a great place to go. And if you just want to be a tourist and snorkel and hang out in the sun, I would recommend Vanuatu over every place in the Pacific, including Fiji, where lots of people go. So this is Tana. And I didn't know what I was doing when I was a student, but luckily one of my professors at uh, UC Berkeley had 
worked for the World Health Organization and it had been to um, what was then the New Hebrides on some health project and uh, had spent a little, little bit of time there and met people. So long story, but I ended up living, oops, li li living in a little village uh, just about here. And here's a volcano just about there. Um, like all good anthropology students, I had a research project which turned out to be completely uh, unworkable. Um, so I ended up doing many other better and different things. But um, Tana, like these islands, is a high volcanic island. It's got mountains in the south um, that raise up to about 35, 3600 feet. Um, a volcano which is named Yasur is just a little cinder cone, um, but it erupts regularly. Every five or six minutes, it sends up lava bombs and ash up into the sky. And whoops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. I should know I'm in a little village just on this ridge over here, so not too far. There's a nice kind of touristic picture of the volcano on the right side there, uh, puffing away, puffing away. So when I get to uh, Tana, um, through missionary connections, I end up in a small village that had been renamed Samaria after the Bible. These were good Presbyterians, um, so I had to go to a lot of church when I was there for the you know, for two years, back in 1978, up, up until 1980. And back on, on the left side, it was traditional Pacific Village, people living in um, houses that would construct themselves uh, out of local material. And here's a picture, not the whole village, but a picture in 1918. If we could see the whole village, we would see that it's shrunk for a variety of reasons, and people are now using different kinds of construction material. Here they are building a house uh, houses out of sheet iron, sheet aluminum, no. Um, so back in 1978, there were 41 people in this village. It was just one big family. Um, and they were connected with other little villages all around the neighborhood. Um, in 2010, when I counted again, they were only 15. Where did they all go? Well, they all had moved two islands north to squatter settlements circling the capital town. Um, they left home because they uh, couldn't find work, they needed money. These people are, as we'll see in a minute, uh, anthropologists call them subsistence horticulturalists. They still grow most of what they eat. Um, so they don't need everyday money like we need. We'd starve to death if we didn't have a wallet in our back pocket or a purse. Uh, but they still need access to cash. And one way they got access to cash is they migrated north to look for work um, up in the capital town, which is a town called Port Vila. Uh, so don't worry about this, but I was counting up how many people had left the island. And back in 1979, um, the pattern was for guys to go north and work in a plantation for maybe three months, maybe six months, and then come home with a little, a little bit of money and um, just start a life back home. So these are mostly unmarried men or younger men. They would go north and work for a little bit. Uh, come home with some money, get married, and stay home. Um, that pattern broke down in, in, in the 70s. From the independence in the 1980s, people continued to leave home, but they didn't come back. So um, geographers who study migration called the former pattern circular. It was, it was, a, it was a kind of a Urban migration mostly, or sometimes up to plantations where people would go to work at a place for a few months and then go back home. And maybe they'd go back again and they'd come back home. So in this country, as in many countries around the Pacific, that circular migration turned into mostly one-way migration where they would leave home and they, they didn't come back. They would spend their life living in, as we'll see, in little settlements um, here and there around uh, Pacific towns mostly, including Port Vila. Um, back home, um, they would live by farming. Um, they weren't too far from the ocean, but these, these folks were not very good uh, fisher folk. Uh, they would reef gather. Uh, women and kids would go down to the ocean and, and uh, pick up shellfish or whatever they could get off the reefs, and the kids would do a little bit of spear fishing. But um, their ancestors had been uh, great uh, voyagers and had come down into these islands 3,000 years ago on big voyaging canoes, but all of that has had disappeared on, 
a century or two ago. So uh, they are farmers and, and good farmers. So they do, anybody taking an anthropology class, they do Sweden or Slash and Byron horticulture, where every season they chop down some of the forest, let it dry, burn it off, and then plant new crops in the ashes. Um, and what do they grow? It's kind of hard to see here. The, pop, the most prestigious crop, popular crop, is a tropical yam, and it's not the yam that we call yam, which is the sweet potato. These are big roots that could be six feet long. Um, they grow taro, which we call elephant ears, maybe your moms and dads plant elephant ears in their gardens. If you could leave those in the ground longer than we could leave them in the ground here because of freezing, leave them in the ground eight, nine, ten months, you can pull them up and eat the root. Um, they grow manioc, which is a South American crop originally, but now it's all through the tropics and it's, it's uh, easy to grow and it's um, less nutritious maybe than the other crops, but takes less labor. And, you know, all kinds of tropi other tropical fruits. And they're into pigs. So back home, you know, if, they, uh, if they're living in the village, they'll put a lot of work into uh, pig husbandry. Because uh, pigs are important. If you're having any kind of ceremony or any kind of um, uh, connection with some other family, like a, a marriage or the birth of a child or a funeral, pigs die. Some poor pig or more pigs are going to be knocked on the head and then cooked and eaten. Um, and when I first arrived, people made a little bit of money from aging coconut plantations. So um, what can you do with coconut? Well, you can make cookies out of it, but you can dry coconut meat. Uh, so they would scoop it out. They would dry. Yeah, they would smoke it. They would smoke dry coconut. And they would sell it into the international oils market, the tropical oils market. But even in the, in the late 70s, 40-something years ago, there were only a few uh, processors in Europe and Singapore that would buy this smoke-dried kava, or co co copra it's called, smoke-dried coconut, because um, they had to purify it. Uh, what do you use coconut oil for? You could use it in soaps and other cosmetics, or you can eat it as a food oil. But if it's smoke-dried, it's way too expensive to, to try to clear up. Um, and it competes with other kinds of tropical oils, especially oil palm. So um, I, I arrived kind of in the, the, the last years of people making money off of their coconut plantations. Um, when I went back in the early 80s to work on some language stuff, um, it, it, people weren't even you know, gathering the coconuts that had dropped off the trees. And the, the rats had just feasted on them anyway. So uh, that had disappeared. Um, instead, um, the only way to make any money was to find a job with the government, which meant maybe you could get a job working on the road system, or if you could go, you could go to school, you could get a job as a school teacher or as some government clerk. So um, families started to push their kids into the educational system, but education wasn't free, and it's still not completely free. So. Uh, it's become more free over the years, but if you've got a child in, back then in elementary school even, you paid school fees. And then certainly if you, if you had a child in one of the high schools, you paid school fees tuition. And maybe only one out of five kids would make it to high school. And then maybe one out of 20 would make it into this little tiny university they had, or go overseas to study abroad. And it all took money. So one of the major reasons why people uh, left home in order to move up to the capital town uh, to earn money was to pay the school fees for their kids because the kids weren't going to make a life anymore uh, growing, you know, harvesting coconuts and drying coconut meat. Uh, they would need to get a job, basically. Um, so that old circular pattern of migration broke down. Uh, people starting in the 80s uh, moved here kind of hard to see, but this is uh, Port Vila, the capital town of Vanuatu. Um, and this is a central ville, so you can see the French influence, but this is downtown, basically. And it starts to spread out, and uh, urban 
migrants coming up, not just from Tana, but from the other 80 islands of the ar archipelago. They move into little settlements that pop up here and pop up over here, which was an old coconut plantation up here. Um, and the population of Formula here uh, expands as many people from around the country decide, oh, I've got to move to town in order to make, make a living. Uh, and uh, see some, some global tourism. Here's a cruise ship in the harbor. Um, there was big news if you're on uh, some of the Vanuatu websites last week. They had two cruise ships in the harbor and they're trying to like juggle where they could, how they could moor. Uh, but back on Tana, um, how would you get up there? So it's, it's 120 miles north. You, um, you would hop one of the inter-island boats, basically. And there's, there's also a local um, air company where if you, had a, if you had the money, which nobody has, you could, you could fly. Um, so you would either, if you've got money, you would take one of these planes. And, and um, this is a big plane, uh, that one that goes down to Tana nowadays. Uh, and it carries mostly tourists. And we'll get to the tourist side of the story in, in a bit. Um, so here's one of the government buildings they had. I took a picture one time in 2009, I guess, of um, the population of this island of Fate, which is where the capital city is. And you can see it's 28% of the national population. And it's even more now as more and more people have moved into town. And um, as I mentioned, it's School fees was the primary, one of the primary drivers of migration. I mean, if you're a subsistence farmer, you know, making your own life and living, living on your own land, on your own island, why would you need money? Um, well, some people don't need money. They can live perfectly fine like that. But if you've got kids and you're worried about your kid's future, then, okay, I'm, I gotta pay the tuition to send these kids to school. And, now I need travel money too because they're going to travel and I'm going to travel to visit them. So um, I need to pay for a, a seat or sitting on the deck of, of one of these inter-island boats. I need, I need cash for that. Um, I need money for clothing in that, you know, my grandparents wore local clothes, local made clothes. Women wore bark skirts and guys wore penis wrappers and that's all they needed. Uh, now they all have to buy secondhand clothes that come in big, in, in large containers, mostly out of Australian um, shippers. They collect charity clothing around Australia and ship it out into the Pacific. Um, plus, town, is, town life is in many ways more interesting than living in a small village with no electricity. You know, people had shortwave radio, but back then there was not much to entertain. Once in a while, some politician would bring a generator and a projector and a screen and some film and, you know, a couple of times a year maybe you would see some Rambo movies. But otherwise, just sitting around, you know, chit-chatting and gossiping and talking and, you know, worrying about local affairs, that's what people did. Up in town, there, there were movie theaters and, you know, people on the streets. This is a parade celebrating something and this is a, this is one of the national holidays where people show up to be entertained. So Port Vila really expands. Here's a map of uh, where people were living at independence in 1980. By 2008, when this map on the right was uh, compiled, then everybody spread into these squatter settlements, which looked like this. I mean, so people throw up housing based on anything they can find, you know, loose bricks, more aluminum sheeting discarded lumber. Uh, so many of the people that I first met back in 1978, when I tried to track them down, you know, when I follow their lives through the 80s and the 90s, I, I don't have to go to Tana anymore, I just go to the capital town because they're all living up there. Or most of them are living up there. Some of them in a settlement called Black Sands. Some guys here. Just pictures, oops, which one am I going here? Some of them in another settlement, Olin, this is Olin Banga. Um, so, you know, you don't have a lot of money, and there's, there's constant, this is Olin Banga, Olin Banga. Uh, so, I've followed, you know, the lives of a number of the friends I made back in the, back in the 70s, you know, up until the present. So here's a girl 
when she was not yet married, living back in that village in 1979. Here she is, and she's still living in Olunabanga in 2010. Now she's a grandmother, you know, and she's been, and she went up to uh, Port Vila in the early 80s, and she's just stuck there, along with many other people. So when, um, oh, here's another one. Um, uh, this is a World War II site where people used to go to work on a plantation there, but by the 80s, they were uh, just constructing kind of settlement housing on the foundation of an old American military hospital. And what were they doing up in town? Well, a lot of the guys, when they moved to town, they left their island to move to town, they become taxi drivers um, and then bus drivers. So if anybody goes to Porfila, there's this incredible number of uh, little minivans, which they call buses, which just constantly circulate through the town. And a lot of uh, my uh, friends who were down in the village, you know, went up and they got employed to drive somebody else's van around town. Or if they had enough money, they got or enough connections, they got employed to drive a taxi around town. By the 2000s, they went into security work. Port Vila is a safe town, as specific towns go, but uh, stores and banks, and any place there was an ATM machine, started hiring security, security to guard, you know, those pr premises. And some of my village friends, you know, got work as, as um, security. And now they've gone even further, about, what were we, 2000, yeah, about almost 10 years ago, New Zealand and then Australia started guest worker programs. So, People can go up to Port Vila and find some work and make some money, but they can make a lot more money in, in six months. I think it's seven months in Australia. If they go overseas now and they work in vineyards and orchards in New Zealand, they work on cattle ranches and other farms in Australia, and they can come home with a couple of thousand bucks, which is a lot of money um, for local people. So. Now everybody's trying to get to New Zealand, New Zealand and Australia. And at least so far, New Zealand and Australia has managed to send almost all of them home. They keep good track of them because they don't want any permanent migrants speaking of migration. So the pattern is reverted back to a circular migration pattern where people are going to New Zealand for six months, coming back to Port Vila with some money, investing the money in building a house or in educating their kids or buying a taxi or a bus, running out of money then migrating back to New Zealand for a second time and then coming back. So unless New Zealand and Australia kind of ease up on their immigration policies, uh, that circular migration pattern probably will continue. But within the country, um, it's kind of, at least until the present, it's been um, one-way migration for the last 30, 40 years, 35 years. Um, what do they do, you know, to make money in these settlements? The guys, you know, try to find work and bus driving, security, some construction work. Uh, the women, uh, if they're educated, they can get work in the stores and in the banks. Port Vila is an international <laughs> finance center, not a very big one, but it's an international finance center. So there are a number of banks and a number of accountancies um, situated there. Or they could do a lot of casual work. So women uh, make some money sewing as seamstresses, doing other people's laundry. There's mini loans, kind of loan sharking. There's a lot of bingo going on where people try to make some money off of gambling. Um, everybody was, everybody's got mobile telephones anymore, so they're kind of hooked into very dubious internet scams. And some of the women, there's a, there's a microcredit association. I don't know if anybody's read very much about this, but there's been a push around the world over the last 20 years to, uh, provide small loans, sometimes to individuals, but often to groups. So they, women will organize themselves or they'll be organized into groups that are going to sell baskets or sew stuff or cook stuff. And they'll get a $200, say, loan from, uh, in one or two is called Van Woods, and then they'll earn money and pay back the loan and and the goal, you know, the, the funder goal is to stimulate business and to, you know, uh, improve women's lives. So, uh, 
July, I think I was there last July, but every July this group has a big celebration where the, a number of women's groups will get together and they'll, they will listen to speeches and they will sell some, <coughs> of the, sell some, some of the stuff that they make. So, you know, how people understood their, their migration? Well, you know, not untypically, you know, people migrate in groups, so if your brother's already moved to Port Vila, you're gonna move up there too and you'll probably live with your brother until you can find your own place and you'll try to find your own place. That's not too far away from the rest of your family. So they've, if you look at those settlements, there's people from all over kind of who pour it in, but they're broken up into tiny little neighborhoods and each little neighborhood is like a, a version of an island village. So they've tried to recreate their island village up in uh, Port Vila, in the settlements around Port Vila. Um, and throughout this part of the Pacific, your connections to place are really important for your understanding of who you are. So what does it mean when you leave home, when your home has defined a lot of who you are, right? So I'm this kind of person because I'm from this place. Do migrants, so it was a question I had, you know, how do migrants try to um, re-identify re themselves when they're in a new place? Well, one thing they could do is they could make the new place look like the old place. So uh, just some quotes from anthropologists about the importance of place. So what they do up in Point Vila is they establish gardens, you know, or we would call little farm plots like they do back at home. So there's a lot of urban gardening that's going on. Um, these guys drink kava, which is this traditional uh, Pacific drug. Uh, and back home on Tana, they, the guys would uh, all come to a local kava drinking ground every evening. So they've created similar little local kava drinking grounds where they can drink Kava, like the way that they drink back at home. So here's a picture on the right from Port Vila, a settlement in Port Vila. Here is a real uh, kava drinking ground back on Tana. Um, over the last uh, couple of decades, they've invented the town chief. So suddenly, instead of living with people your families have lived next to for 3,000 years, you're now living in an urban settlement where somebody, you know, over here there's people from another island. On this side, there's people from a third island, and how do you, you know, how do you, how do you deal with conflict? So um, they invented the, and they call it town chief. They invented the town chief, who are just older, more respected guys who come in every time there's a fight. Sometimes a fight within the, the local migrant community, but often a fight when it's between uh, folks from two different or three different islands. And they all sit, to get, sit down and they try to figure out how to settle things. So this was an old friend of mine from Tana who had moved up to Port Vila and become a, one of these town chiefs. And then, how do they keep, their, keep up their connections with home? What well, was difficult, um, they, before 2007, 2008, um, you would, nobody writes much, uh, so you couldn't really write a letter home, but if somebody was going back and forth, you would grab that person and you would give them a bunch of instructions and maybe you'd give them some, a bag of rice that you would send back home. So you have to rely on people to carry messages from Tana Island up to Port Vila and back. 2007, 2008, mobile telephony comes in and almost within a year, every single person in the country has a mobile telephone from you know, six year olds up through 80 year olds. Uh, so people really went for cell phones because they now can just call family back home uh, anytime they want to, anytime they've got the money um, to use a phone. And they're very clever. Anthropologists have got it, gotten into studying um, the effect of mobile telephones, cell telephones, not just in Vanuatu, but you know, throughout the world, basically. And uh, there's some really interesting studies from Jamaica, from Papua New Guinea, from Vanuatu, about what the mobile telephone has done you know, what it allows and how people use it in their own ways. Um, so people don't want to, they're not complete migrants. So almost everybody you talk to up in Port Vila says, oh yes, I'm going to go home someday. So they, they need to keep up connections with home. And one way they keep up connections with home is, is illness explanations. So if somebody gets sick, they think, oh no, we need to send this person home to eat island food because this town is spoiling you know, people's health. 
So illness often sparked reconnection between island village and town settlement. Uh, if somebody dies, if they can, they'll collect enough money to fly the body back home to Tana, because they don't want to bury, you don't, you don't want to get buried away from your place, or away from your home. Uh, and nobody wants to bury their relative, their dead relative, unless they're really forced to, up in Port Vila, because that's somebody else's land, that's somebody else's place. So death kept that connections. Um, and then interesting things were happening back on Tana too. So kids, you know, when they hit teenage years, Almost all of them now are going to run off to go up to Port Vila. So how do you remind them that they still have family back home? And if they make any money up in Port Vila, they should send some back to you. Um, so there was always a kind of a ceremony around a boy's first shave. But back in the 70s, people hardly ever did it. And maybe they'd kill a chicken. And you know, they'd say, oh, son, you're becoming a man. Now you're shaving. But in years since, they've really elaborated these first shave ceremonies. And my interpretation is they want to remind these boys who are going to run off to Port Vila of their family duties. So everybody gives them a huge pile of presents uh, to celebrate the fact that they've shaved for the first time. Uh, and here's some boys coming in who have, uh, haven't completely shaved, but um, it's celebrating their their beard, basically, or their shaving of their beard, and everybody's behind them with presents that they're about to get them. And um, you can remind the kids, oh, yes, you're going to move up to Port Vila, but um, uh, don't forget the family back home. And look at all the stuff we've given you, raising you up, right? Um, plus, you know, the typical story about uh, urban migration is that people move to town to make money, and they send the money back to the, where they come from. So um, if anybody's been to any kind of um, you know, Mexican restaurant or, or Mexican grocery store. There's probably Western Union and other service posters in the windows and on the walls about how to send money back to Mexico, right? Because that's what you should do, or back to Guatemala or back to Honduras or wherever. Um, and there's some of that going on, but life in Port Vila is so hard and people are, you know, saving the money for, you know, educating their kids. They're not sending a whole lot back home, but actually it's the people back in the island that send food up to the family up in the village. So uh, it was kind of interesting. This, you know, sending money back home is a remittance. But uh, a lot of these people are doing kind of a backwards remittances, where instead of urban folk supporting family back in home villages, it's people who are, who are still back in the villages sending food and even money. I, I've carried money from the village, village grandmas to their granddaughter up in Port Vila, because I feel sorry for them, since life up in those settlements is, although you can maybe make a salary. It's, Still not easy. And people don't like it. So I had a project 2010, 2011, when I went around and interviewed a lot of these people who had left the village and moved into the town and asked them, how do you like town? And they all like some of it, but they all complain, you know. Uh, you know, one of the main complaints is money. So they're there to make money, but they don't like money. Like, back, here, back home on town, everything's free. You know, food is free. There's a lot of gift giving. We don't pay for water, we don't pay for electricity. Um, you know, we can make a life with no money. But up here in town, they charge you even to go to the toilet. And it's true, if you go to the marketplace in Port Vila and you want to use some of the, uh, the public toilets, they'll ask for 25 cents or 50 cents. So there's a lot of complaint about town life. And, Marijuana, right? People are going crazy smoking too much weed up in Port Vila. So there's a suspicion that the kids are going wrong. Um, so I'm going to go through. You don't have to worry. I've interviewed these people about, you know, how's life in town versus life back in the village. And so Uri here says, oh, we got a lot of respect and love and peace. But up here in town, there's small respect. Peace is small. And here's a guy saying life in town is tough. Uh, the local currency is the Batu. Um, you want to sleep, you have to pay. If you want a, a house, you have to pay. If you want water, you have to want food. Uh, same thing over here. So a lot of this is phrased in terms of respect, which is, I won't go down that line very far, but for some reason, which has become a pidgin English term, respect, uh, about people treat each other right or wrong. And they're all, and so 
people like living in town, but they're suspicious of it. Um, but one thing that's happened back in town, back in Tana, back in this village, is as a, the backwards or the reverse of the settlement being constructed so that it was like an island village. The island village now is being reconstructed so it looks more like a town, partly by bringing in new technology, like here's a solar panel, uh, new roads are going in, uh, where it was a foot trail up until 2018, and tourists. So here's my, my story changes a little bit. Um, so over the years, so we had circular migration that then turns into one-way <laughs> migration, where it looks like the whole island's going to empty out because there's no money to be made on Tana. But suddenly, there's money to be made, because the other thing that kicked in just after moving to town was an increase in the number of foreign tourists uh, who come down to Tana. And they almost all come to see that volcano. So there's um, a new, new reason. So now people are moving back home. And they try life in Point Vila and they say, well, look, I could just go back to Tana um, and I could build a bungalow. So the new thing on this island is to build a tourist bungalow, they call them, and charge these tourists 30 bucks a night to stay in my bungalow. There's, if you're lucky, there's a water s supply system. Uh, there won't be any electricity. Um, but some of them are fairly nice. Um, and I can make more money with, out, out of the tourist business than I can, you know, working as a taxi driver up in Port, Port Vila. Um, so the country now uh, makes not just Tana, but Vanuatu as a whole, the main source of um, GDP of, uh, of national income now is tourism. Uh, and tourism has really boomed. And they come in on those cruise ships, and they come in on planes, uh, mostly Australia, New Zealand, a little bit New Caledonia, a little bit Japan and China, a little bit US. But tourism is taken over. And here's my survivor, Vanuatu. So if anybody knows anything about Vanuatu, they watch this 2,000-something survivor episode. Um, and they also try to sell local custom or tradition. So there's an occasional big island-wide exchange dance festival that the tourist entrepreneurs uh, keep their ears open for when one might occur, and they'll bring tourists to see that. Uh, there is a, social, a couple of social movements on the island, uh, which sometimes attract some tourists. Uh, this one on the West Tana uh, says they've completely gone back to tradition. So every time a tourist bus comes up, they take off all their clothes and they put on penis wrappers. But as soon as the bus goes away, they, away, they put their clothes back on and put their, they get their mobile phones out. Uh, but they pretend to be traditional. Uh, or they, even more dubiously, they say, OK, come on, you can experience cannibals. So we'll give you a phony cannibal uh, tour. Uh, so here's Kelsen's cannibals. Uh, and then there's this uh, so-called cargo cult that's still going on this island, and a few tourists We'll pay a bit of money to go visit the movement headquarters, these guys. But mostly it's the volcano. Um, and it's best at night, which is good, because if you could just see the volcano, you, know, you could fly down in, in the morning and then see the volcano and fly back in the afternoon. There's two flights, at least two flights a day down to this island. Uh, but that doesn't make much local money. But if you could get the tourists to stay overnight, you can charge them for a place to sleep at least. And, um, that's why all the bungalows are going up. And they, here's the tourist up on top of the volcano. Here's an old picture of that volcano before there was a road up the back side of it. You used to have to hike up the thing, and it's ash. It's like a huge mound, it's a 900 tall uh, mound of volcanic ash, which was not the easiest thing to hike up. But back in the 70s, that's how I went up it. Uh, early 80s, the government carved a road up the back side. So now these tourists only have to walk the last 100 yards up from where they park the, the um, trucks. Um, and you know they come up right at dusk to watch the thing explode. Um, and then, um, I guess at night, uh, you could watch those lava bombs go up and down, and they're quite spectacular. 
occasionally in a real, in a real high wind, they'll blow out of the caldera and come down and smash gathered tourists. A couple of them have died over the years, some poor Japanese woman, or have broken legs and arms from being smashed by a fiery hot lava bomb. But most of the time, it just goes straight up and goes straight down. Um, so these guys now have a new way to make money, which is really changing you know, people's lives. And they can stay home now um, and sell their bungalows. And for some reason, tree houses, they build these places for tourists to sleep. I don't think I'd do it, but you know, here and here. Uh, and, I don't, and this is completely non-traditional, but they've caught on to the fact that they could sell a treehouse experience to crazy Australians or whatever, some Americans too. Uh, so there's all kinds, here's the way into the volcano now, which is completely new on the right. Here's the Yasuru, that's the name of the volcano, Yasuru Lodge on, on the left. Uh, this is from last year when I was down there. And you can make bookings on, you know, bookings.com. So we'll see in a minute, a friend of mine was trying to build one of these bungalows and he was getting it onto Airbnb and bookings.com. So they're quite sophisticated. Uh, and here's one that says, okay, you get a toilet paper in your bathroom and you get a terrace, ha ha. Uh, you can bring your dog if you want, you know. Um, and you can stay in a place like that. Or here's another one, volcano front bungalow. Uh, here's my friend Ephraim, who was trying to build one of these things, and he was connecting uh, a water pipe up to the spring so that there'd be some water in it, which most tourists would probably want. Uh, and that's the story up to the present. So, uh, and this is this is just one island, one little village on one island, but it's it's probably a typical story for a lot of the Pacific. Or over the last four decades, people have really moved to town, so they're leaving their home villages moving into a capital town. And some, like Samoans and Tongans, can go even further. They move to the metropolitan countries. So they move to the US down here, or the, the Micronesians you know, move over down here to Arkansas to work in Tyson chicken processing plants. Uh, the Tongans and Samoans can get as far as Hawaii, um, California, and especially Australia and New Zealand. People in Vanuatu are kind of stuck in their own country, except for these occasional uh, work periods when they're guest workers down in, down in, um, in New Zealand and Australia. Um, so there's been a lot of out-migration, um, but now there's this fantastic growth in tourism. We'll see how long it lasts, but this is allowing people to stay home. And uh, they have to put up with tourists, but uh, they can you know, make a hundred bucks off of a visiting tourist couple over a weekend, you know, that, that might take them a month to make living up in a squatter settlement. So uh, that's the story of this one small place, which, which I think has got implications for much of the rest of the Pacific. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to entertain questions. Oh. I appreciate the clapping. <laughs> yes. Quick question. Uh, I can see the happy a lot in Africa right now. Is there a tribute to the Chinese development? Oh, uh, yeah, um, all through the former third world, whatever you want to call it anymore, there's a Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So the Chinese have invested a lot in Africa, but they're also um, throughout the Pacific as well. And um, Tana, they, so if you go to Port Vila, a lot of the, the local stores are Chinese owned and people have dealt with Chinese store owners for a century. And they make a distinction now between the old Chinese, which are kind of intermarried into the community. They, they came in the 1910s and 1920s, and they're okay with them. But then there's, over the last 15 years, a lot of new Chinese who have just showed up, and nobody can quite figure out exactly how or how, you know, a hundred stores selling the same range of Chinese produced product can possibly make a living in a small town of 50,000 people. Uh, and there's more hostility against them. So down on town, people say, we're keeping the Chinese out. Although the Chinese have just spent a ton of money to improve the road system, which you need for tourism. So there's Chinese investment in, or in roads, and it's either loan money, and there's a lot of concern about debt traps, where China comes in and lends you $5 million, which your government is not going to be able to repay, so they'll come and take something instead. But they do 
<laughs> yeah, there's a suspicious base of the Chinese funded up on another island, Espiritu Santo, and whether or not that may turn into a Chinese Navy base. So all of a sudden, the Australians... So what happened is, at end of, after independence, the French stayed around, because they want to maintain French influence in this country and uh, promote Francophony. More people speaking French, the better. Uh, the British went home. They closed their embassy or, or their high commission. Um, but now, with fear of what's going on with China, uh, the British have, are back. They've opened up a high commission. The Australians have announced new uh, deals with Pacific Island countries, inclu including Vanuatu. So from an earlier talk today, the Australians were blocking the importation of Vanuatu kava. Now they've just opened it up as one impact of that. And the U.S. now has announced a new Pacific initiative because the U.S. Ha hasn't paid any attention to this part of the world for years. But now, thanks to China, uh, it is, um, you know, and whether or not China has good intent or bad intent, you know, we don't know, but it's worried, it's made some people worried, and so it's worrisome to, to, to some. Um, and people in Vanuatu, because they lived in this weird colony where the British and the French together ruled it, but could never agree amongst themselves, so local people for generations since 1906 develop really good skills of playing off one side against the other side. So the British were making trouble for you. You'd go complain to the French, and they would you know, push back against the British, or vice versa. So the more aid donors coming in, the happier Vanuatu people are, because they're good at playing one, 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 uh, one camp off against another, another side. But yeah, China is there in a major way, as it is in most of the Pacific nowadays. Yes? Are there any natural predators on the island that get threats to humans? None. It's very not. Well, sea snakes and conefish, a few snorkel, uh, but they don't really get that many people. Uh, there's, n there's only one snake in Vanuatu, and it's not poisonous. Uh, it's only in the northern part, so no snakes. Uh, there are no spiders that are going to get you. And the biggest mammal is a pig. Because uh, they're out in the Pacific, so the only um, animals that are there are those who managed to get there on their own somehow. Um, or they were brought there by humans, and that includes the pig, the rat, the chicken, mostly. But no, it's not like Africa, so with no lions or tigers or bears. Uh, so it's a, quite a safe place. Except in the water, in, in the ocean, there are a few things that are kind of dangerous, but usually don't kill people. A few crocodiles up in the north. So good for tourists. Yes? Nobody really knows. It's, you know, Captain James Cook shows up on this island in 1774, and he's the first to describe that volcano. And it was acting the same back then, you know, as it does today. Um, geologists. Presum oh, I should know more geology. Presumably there was a huge volcano which made the island, and it looks like half of it now has fallen into, eroded into the sea, and what's left of that original huge volcano is this one little pimple, pimple ash cone, which for some reason uh, it, it still is connected to magma sources, so it's still bubbling up and exploding um, every five, ten minutes. And then there are hot springs. So the other thing they could sell to tourists is hot springs. You know, go sit in the hot springs. And they're quite nice. Some of them run into the ocean, so you could go uh, sit in these little um, tide pools, basically, where they're warmed by, you know, by uh, underwater, you know, hot springs coming up. Um, but, you know, when that volcano uh, originated, it probably a long time ago. It was there. Humans show up about 3,000 years ago on these islands, and it was, it was probably their thing. So it's a nice, I mean, as volcanoes go, it's a really easy one to check out. Yes? You got a silly question about cannibals and headhunters all extinct. You know, these people never hunted head. Uh, there were some up in the Solomon Islands, which is to the northwest. Whether or not they eat people has been a major bone of contention among anthropologists. They say they did, uh, but you had to be from the right family line. You had to 
be of the right ancestry to actually eat somebody. And they used to exchange bodies and turtles. Uh, so you'd send a turtle one way and they'd send you back a, a body another way. But only certain, only certain people were with the right kinship background. So, you know, who wants to be a cannibal? But you can sell it, you can market yourself as a cannibal to tourists. And a lot of people have figured that out. So no more, and anthropologists make a distinction between what we call exocannibalism, am I eating a stranger that I've killed, somebody I don't like, and endocannibalism, am I eating grandma? So um, that probably was common. So grandma dies and you bury her and then you dig up what's left and you grind up some of her bones and you kind of drink that as a way to incorporate grandma into your own self and own identity. So that went on. But they, probably more than you know, trying to eat somebody that you've killed in warfare. On these islands, which are big islands, but after a few thousand years, everybody's related to everybody else. So um, if there was cannibalism, it was always a form of eating a kid. Yeah, he was up in New Guinea, up in Papua, the western side of the big island of New Guinea. And there's all kinds of stories there. If you don't know this, uh, one of, uh, uh, which, which Rockefeller? John. Um, had a son, his name was Michael, I was trying to figure out his father's name, who was, uh, I mean, both the dad and the son were big collectors of uh, New Guinea art, and he was up trying to collect art among the Asmat, which is a big artistic um, carving community over on the Indonesian side of New Guinea, and disappeared, and there's all kinds of stories. Did he just drown? Did he get eaten by a crocodile? Did somebody knock him on the head and eat him? So if you're interested, there are several books about what might have happened to Michael Rockefeller. But yet yeah, they're a thousand something miles away over on the big island of New Guinea. So these guys, they might have done a little bit of cannibalism, but it's been a long time. Yes? The people on these islands related ethically to, uh, say, New Guinea or... Yeah, yeah. Or, or they're just doing the DNA research now. So um, they're apparently, I don't know how far to get here. The first people who, sailed out into these islands were Lapita potters. And genetically, they're more related to people from Ta the indigenous communities of Taiwan and the northern Philippines. But they're quickly followed by people um, with different DNA out of New the New Guinea area. Um, and they're mixed. So some of the, today, if you DNA these people, they look a little bit like people in the Philippines and uh, Aboriginal Taiwan. And they look a lot like people who live in New Guinea and Solomon Islands. But the weird thing is the languages are all uh, languages from uh, southern Taiwan, related to languages of southern Taiwan and, and uh, northern Philippines. And then it's Austronesian. So it goes from Madagascar over to Easter Island. And so if you get a lot of, so it's a big mystery that the archaeologists are trying to figure out why you would have all of these so-called Papuan peoples, or maybe intermarried with some of the Austronesian peoples but they all dumped their home languages and picked up Austronesian languages. So all of the languages in Vanuatu today are Austronesian and not Papuan, even though the people are genetically more Papuan than they are Austronesian. Okay, well, thank you for staying until the end. I appreciate the chance to talk about one of my favorite places.